in a while. So I like to uh, do sort of zoom out to you know, remind everybody how great or big our universe is. So let's start. So we are basically here in the birth of uh, Leiden, of course, and you know, like, um, this is more or less one kilometer. We can zoom out very quickly. Um, we are somewhere here, 10,000 kilometers. So now we are on the side of the Earth. Of course, we all know that the Earth is not everything in the cosmos. And I actually like this picture because this shows you like uh, the Earth and the Moon for scale. So everything is real, so the distance and also the relative size. So of course, uh, the Earth and the Moon. This is this starts to be like an interesting distance because now even light, which is like very you know, very fast, still needs at least a few seconds to go from this point to that point. Of course, we can just zoom out further. We are in the solar system now. We are now not talking about light seconds but light minutes. At the edge of the solar system, we talk about light days. Uh, and then, if we zoom further, then things start to get interesting because you start you start to see like the neighboring stars. Of us, and then we start to talk about light years. Okay, we can zoom even further out, and this is like a scale which I really like because this is our own Milky Way, which uh, which is uh, more or less uh, one hundred thousand light years long. Here, uh, you see that we're here, and there are many many interesting systems and stellar objects in our solar system, uh, in our Milky Way. Sorry. One of them is of course supernovae. I'm not going to explain that now, but you probably all know this is a star that just explodes at the end of its life. Uh, and also if you look at the very center, what you see is that you see a lot of stars really orbiting here around a sort of uh, center, which is completely dark actually, so you don't see anything. And now we know that at this location there is actually a huge mass which is dark, which is actually a supermassive black hole. So something which is several uh, millions times the mass of our sun. And so it's something which is three quite sense, which is not really very active, otherwise that would just emit a lot of light. But I'm going to come back to that later. So if we just zoom even further out, now we have our Milky Way here, but we start to see also uh, a lot of other galaxies, right? So now we talk about one million light years. Um, the Andromeda galaxy is really well famous, it's there. The Triangle galaxy, which is there. Fun fact, this is actually the only galaxy that we know which for sure has no supermassive black hole in the center. We still don't really understand why, but uh, yeah, that's still something interesting. If we zoom further out, then things start to be even more interesting because every little dot here is actually a single galaxy. Now we talk about 100 million of light here, and you start to see also that galaxies are not spread everywhere. They are rather uh, clustered to actually galaxy clusters. So, for example, we are in the outskirts of the Virgo cluster here. And so, if we zoom out, of course, we see a lot of galaxies here. And at the center of the Virgo cluster, there's one huge giant elliptical galaxy, which is known as M87. If we zoom there, what we see is something very interesting. Because if you zoom here, what you see is that from the very center of the galaxy down to the outskirts of the galaxy, there's a, a huge jet. We know today that this jet comes from the central supermassive black hole of this galaxy. So this is a supermassive black hole which is very different from our own galaxy because it's very active. It has a lot of material uh, spinning around it and then just pr produce this jet. And what I would like to show you here is that this jet is like very huge, you know? It goes uh, basically 500, uh, 5,000 light years here. And of course, at the very center here, there's this beautiful supermassive black hole which you probably all know from a few years ago, I think it's a nice picture from the Event Horizon Telescope. So what I want to say here is that supermassive black holes are able to impact uh, things at scales of an entire galaxy. And of course, if we zoom really at the scale of the universe, we start to see that all these individual galaxies are again not distributed uniformly, but they reform a sort of filamentary structure, sort of cosmic web. Right, let's just take one uh, galaxy cluster. So this is Evo 1689, beautiful one that you can just see with uh, you know, like optical light. And of course, uh, we can observe many things in the universe with optical telescope, right? So for example, with uh, the light observatory here, the Hubble Space Telescope, which everybody knows. But there are a lot of colors, actually, a lot of colors that our eye cannot see directly. This is, for example, radio, uh, radio waves, which uh, Eric is going to tell you in a uh, but also X-rays, and for X-rays we can just send uh, satellites in space and then we can look at the X-ray sky to report the high energy uh, events and uh, phenomena of our universe. 
Okay, now let's go back to this ELIC cluster and let's look at it in x rays. What do we see? We see something like this. Something really strange, right? Because we don't see galaxies anymore, we just see like a very, very diffuse, very blurred emission everywhere. If I just superimpose the two images, this is what we get. And about 45 years ago from now, we have understood, well, not me, but you know, scientists have understood that this comes from a very hot gas, what we call actually the intra cluster iridium. Uh, a gas which is ext extremely hot, so 10 to 100 millions of degrees, which is why we see it in X-rays. Uh, it's also very tenuous, so one particle per uh, cubic decimeter. It's also heavily ionized. So, for those of you who remember uh, basic physics classes, so you have a lot of ions and free electrons everywhere here, like a sort of gigantic soup of ions and, and, and electrons. All right, so why do we care? Well, we care because just imagine that you take all the stars, all the planets, you know, from these galaxy clusters, all this cool gas from, uh, from the galaxy, and you put it in this square. Well, this is still very little compared to the mass of this, well, of this intra cluster medium here. Which means that basically uh, the, the bulk of the visible matter, what we call variants, the universe, are in this form of this very hot gas. Of course, this is still nothing compared to what we call dark matter, which is a sort of mysterious matter uh, from which we don't really know the nature. I'm not going to talk about that in this talk, but you know, this is something, uh, something else. Anyway, so let's just go back to the intra cluster medium and uh, let's just take our X ray telescope. So here it's a Newton, for example, and let's look at a parcel of gas. What we can do is that we can sort of classify. Uh, the brightness, the, the X-ray brightness of uh, this uh, cluster as a function of the energy or the wavelength or just like sort of small slices of, of colors that you, that you see. So for each different X-ray color, kind of, we can just say how bright the, uh, the cluster is. And that gives what we call in astronomy a spectrum. And what you can notice here is that this spectrum is not smooth. It's actually full of little jumps, little bumps here. And this is, for example, very visible here. And these bumps correspond to line emissions from chemical elements. So the way it works, basically, is just that you have, for example, here an iron ion here, an electron spinning around it, and at some point the electron will just jump from what we call an orbital, just an energy level in the atom, and by doing so it will just uh, release uh, an X-ray photon that will just be at the exact same energy, just corresponding to an energy here. And that's how we have these lines. But this is absolutely extraordinary because this means that the intra cluster region contains diverse chemical elements. This is absolutely fantastic, and I'm going to explain you why. Just a few minutes after the Big Bang, all the elements in the universe were hydrogen and helium, so the two lightest elements of the universe that we know. All the other, what we call metals, all the, the heavy chemical elements. Could it be carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, etc.? We know they come from another source, which is supernovae, stars and supernovae. So basically, supernovae are the only way to produce metals, so all these relevant helium, uh, helium, uh, helium and hydrogen. So, in other words, you know, Omar probably this beautiful quote from Carl Sagan that we are all made of stars. So, you, do, me, uh, this glass of beer here, absolutely. Yeah. They were all at some point, uh, all these atoms were at some point forged in the very core, the burning core of uh, supernovae. There are two types of supernovae. So the first one is actually if you take a massive star, a big blue massive star, which just runs at the end of its life because it's, it, it runs kind of out of hydrogen, then it just explodes as what we call a core collapse supernova. This core collapse supernova will produce a lot of elements, but mostly um, light elements. So typically oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon. So for a little bit of argon as well. So for example, the oxygen you breathe, the, the beer that you that you drink, this the oxygen the water, all come from core collapse supernovae. Next to that, we can also imagine a low mass star, so typically mass of the sun, in a binary system where you just have like two of the stars here. One of them just dies as what we call a white dwarf and will sort of accrete the material of the other star here. By doing so, it will just gain mass, and at some point, this mass will be way too much for this white dwarf, which will completely explode as type 1 supernova. Type 1 supernova is not a kind of supernova. It's a bit different in the sense that it produces other elements, so iron, nickel, uh, calcium, argon, uh, 
uh, sulfur, silicon, etc. Et so the irony of load, for example, comes from type 1 as well. Alright, so now we know that all these elements are actually uh, in the intracluster regions, not only within galaxies, where they probably started, so where stars and supernovae are, but also between galaxies. Which is fantastic, right? Because it means that the elemental bricks of life are also found at the larger scales of the universe. And what we want to understand is how and when did all these exploding stars start to what we call enrich, so really eject and mix the products outside of their galaxies. And to do so, what we can do is actually look at some of these clusters. So for example, here the Centaurus cluster, that we see in the optical. Uh, and if we look at it in X-ray, this is basically what we get. And what we can do is uh, do what, well, measure what we call a radial abundance profile. So what it is, is just like we take as a function of the distance from the center, you just look at the concentration of metals that you have, so what we call the metal abundance. If you do that, you see that we have a lot of metals in the core. But then, if we go very, very far away from uh, the core, the metals don't drop to zero. There's still some amount of metals which is always reaching a universal scale here, so more or less 0.3 solar. So about one third of the concentration of metals we have in the sun. And this is very, very important because basically the gas that is here has not accreted yet, has not fallen yet to the cluster. So it's a sort of very old and ancient gas. So in that sense, looking away from the center is like looking in the past. And that means that this gas has been enriched already a long time ago. By what? Oh, yes, sorry. First, I want to show you here uh, this, uh, this real data, just to see that this is not simply a simple plot. And so by what these metals have been enriched? Well, actually, um, by it has been uh, probably ejected by supermassive black holes in the form of huge jets and huge outflows that probably happened a very long time ago, so before clusters and groups started to form, so more than 10 billion years ago. So in other words, most metals in the universe were probably produced so by supernovae, ejected outside of galaxies by supermassive black holes uh, more than 10 billion years ago, so before clusters started to form. All right, so if I just go back to this plot here, so you know, a massive star versus low mass stars, which gives respectively core collapse supernovae and type 1 supernovae, uh, this is very interesting because another thing we can do and measure is actually what we call the abundance ratio. So just the quantities of oxygen over iron, or neon over iron, or magnesium over iron, etc. Et Doing so, we actually have a good uh, difference between the core collapse economy here on the numerator and the type 1 economy on the denominator. And we can so sort of trace the relative enrichment between these two different types of supernovae. And we can do that for various systems. So for example, we can do that for our own solar system here. And we just measure different ratios. And I just want to put all of them to one, you know, that sort of convention here. Uh, because why? Because we are going to compare that with the ratios we have, or the chemical composition we have for the intra region. And when we do that, what we see is that both agree remarkably well. So in other words, the chemical composition of the intra region is remarkably similar to the chemical composition of our own sun, of our own solar system. And this is something remarkable because there's no reason for that. I mean, if you just look at our galaxy, we have a lot of uh, blue, big, massive stars because we have a lot of blue points here, so probably a lot of corporate supernovae. While for the intra region, we have a lot of red galaxies, so a lot of uh, red, uh, low mass stars, but almost no corporate supernovae at all. So it's still very, yeah, very strange actually. But that might actually come from the fact that this enrichment has been universal for a very, very long time ago. Anyway, so I will just leave you with uh, this uh, conclusion here. So the link between supernovae, supermassive black hole, and large scale universe is actually metals. It's actually what we are all made of. So basically, we are all made of star stuff, which is present absolutely everywhere in the universe. And I will leave you here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francois, for this great talk. So then we're on to the questions. Does someone have a question? Yes, I think you're going to have to shout and then we'll repeat. Okay. Um, if you look at the current black holes and the jets that they are having, uh, we know how much. 
how much mass they, these jets produce, then given the fact that you uh, will want to enrich the entire universe, how many of those uh, big jets and uh, black holes should we have then? And where are they coming up? Yes. So I'll just repeat your question. It's uh, very interesting, Garki. How many, how many jets we would need basically to enrich the entire universe, the entire cluster of volume, knowing that we know that uh, supermassive black hole with a given mass gives a certain z, a certain power. This is actually a very good question. Um, however, there's still something. Okay, I think this is a, a very nice uh, sketch here. By the time everything was enriched, so probably more than 10 billion years ago, what we think is that supermassive black holes were into another mode of producing of uh, feedback, basically. So when a black hole accretes just a little bit of material, indeed it produces jets, which is the case now. But uh, at very, very high redshifts, what we believe is that supermassive black holes were accreting so much that they produced what we call outflows which look more like actually what you have on the right of the picture here. So, it's still not really clear how this outflow works, to be honest. This is still something that we need to find. And, uh, for example, I'm sure that uh, James W. Uh, GWST, so the James Webb Space Telescope that will be launched very soon, will really help us to, to find this question. Thank you. Another question from the audience. Yes. Yes, hi. Um, are you saying that all the galaxy clusters show the same abundances of metals? And if that's what you're saying, does that mean that um, the enrichment happened before the scale of the universe was so big that it couldn't travel, or that it's a universal process that's happening everywhere? Yeah, so uh, your question was about the fact that so we find same abundances everywhere. The universe. Uh, I'm not sure I understood your first explanation. Can you repeat it? Well, do you find the same abundances in all galaxy clusters, or is it uh, do you find differences between the different clusters that are observed? No, we find something that is very, very similar. There are two things to consider here. The first one is the absolute abundance of metals, so like really the abundance, the absolute metallicity. And the other thing is the relative ratio. So for example, as I showed, oxygen over iron or magnesium over iron. If we talk about the absolute metallicities, we have something that in the center of cluster, they can vary a little bit. Not that much, but they can vary. But then when you, when you look at outskirts, maybe I can just come back to uh, this plot really quickly. Yes, here. When you look at outskirts, this 0.3 level is the same for all clusters, as far as we know. We need, of course, to have no more measurement, uh, no but as far as we know, this is remarkably the same. And then when, uh, when it's about ratios, then we also know that this is remarkably the same everywhere. So in that sense, we three see that this enrichment is universal. Although in the center here, there are still some variations from time to time that we also need to understand. Another question? Yes. I'm not familiar with this uh, subject, but if you describe this whole process, would that mean that heavier elements are younger than lighter elements in the universe? Oh, yes. Because uh, from what I understand, of course it starts with helium and, and uh, hydrogen, but then you know the, these metals start forming. You have these two kind of uh, supernovae that you described. One seems uh, um, more modern, so to say, than the other. And would that mean that, that, that elements will get heavier in the future that are being produced in this way? Okay. This is also an excellent question. So just uh, to repeat the question, uh, whether the elements that are produced, since they come from different supernovae, so with different uh, times, yeah. basically, whether at some point they will all transform into heavier and heavier elements, right? Well, there are two, two parts here in the, in the answer. Maybe I will just come back to one of these slides. Which one is it? Yes, here. So for core collapse supernovae, uh, this happens very, very fast, astronomically speaking. 30 million years is basically almost nothing. We all know that, right? 
uh, the other the other channels, the type one supernovae, they happen very very slow, and the reason for that is just because low mass stars are they grow very very old very very slowly. Now, what happened at the beginning of the universe? This is not sure yet, but probably that a lot of massive stars were first created, which means that probably these elements were released first. But we don't have uh, necessary tools yet. We don't have enough uh, powers on our telescope to really probe that. That's one of the first uh, uh, answer. Then, second, of course, all these elements which are created here, so oxygen, magnesium, etc., when they leave the galaxy, there's very, very little chance that they will just go back and form a new star because they are already spread and lost in the intra-cluster medium. So these elements will stay there. But it's true that if you look at the universal scales, what should happen as time goes is that you should have more and more of iron compared to oxygen or iron compared to magnesium, etc. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, can you repeat? I don't think so. The metal elements are relatively light compared to what elements can be in your atomic number. How the bigger elements are produced? That's also a very good question. Elements like gold, for example, or silver, how they are produced, right? Yes. Uh, this is something actually that we started to understand uh, thanks to LIGO. So I don't know if you remember LIGO, or we found that neutron stars could merge and, you know, and we could actually detect the gravitational waves. When this was done, we could also be sure that a neutron star merger will happen. And then with optical telescope, we could actually look at their spectrum, and then we found traces of gold or silver. So in that sense, we believe that those even heavier elements, like gold, silver, platinum, etc., are produced by neutron star collisions. Some scientists say also that this may be produced by, uh, in actually, low mass stars, uh, in, with some very uh, complex processes, which I'm not going to also because I'm not really an expert. <laughs> so this can be those, uh, those two channels. But this is completely different from core collapse and type 1 super. All right, let's give them a final applause.
see our top three scorers so far. So Einstein first provided physical evidence of a black hole in 1916 along with his theory of general relativity. Is this true or is it false? story 
this book, so there has been no evidence of the Higgs boson decaying into dark matter particles, but the lack of uh, decay has put some uh, some constraints on the rate that this was decaying. Thank you. 
this one. But if the man manages to stay strong, really. And question number 10.
start with another introduction, but I decided to have the introduction the other way around. So where Francois decided to zoom out, starting from the Earth, and going towards the scales of galaxy clusters. I like to zoom in, basically taking the entire universe and zooming back into where galaxy clusters actually live in the universe. So let's start all the way from the beginning. About 13 billion years ago, the universe was created by some regarded as a bad move, but I mean, we have to make do with what we have. And at the start, the universe was basically a hot soup of fundamental particles and uh, light. But the light couldn't really go anywhere because the universe universe was so hot that the light just kept bouncing around between the hot particles. So when the universe expanded and cooled off gradually, about 400,000 years after the start of the universe, the first light escaped and this light actually still permeates the universe today and we can observe this light and we have observed this light and that's the green blob that you are seeing on the slide right here is the cosmic microwave background. And now why is it why is it all the same color? That's because the cosmic microwave background, the first light we have from the universe, is actually ridiculously uniform. Basically, in every direction where we look, we see basically the same light, the same intensity, the same temperature coming towards us. But the thing is, it's not perfectly uniform. So if we use really, really precise instruments, and we take away the interference from the sun, from the Milky Way, from all other sources where we're not interested in at the moment, then we can get a map like this. So this is the first light of the universe, which is zoomed in, where you can see fluctuations in the temperature of the first light, uh, which are one part in a hundred thousand. So really, really tiny fluctuations, but it's actually these fluctuations that grow to be galaxy clusters and the large scale structure of the universe that we have today. So the red parts on this map, they're a little bit hotter than the blue parts of the map, and a little bit denser, and under the influence of gravity, the little bit denser regions grow denser and denser, while the blue regions basically lose their, lose their matter. So this, this nice, nice little illustration, sort of skipping through time at a very, very fast pace now, from the start of the universe to uh, the current day. You can see that from a initially relatively uniform fields of, uh, of mass, of matter in the universe. When we turn on gravity and we turn on time, the matter starts to plump in regions where there's a lot of matter already, where there's a high density, and it starts to basically be pulled away from regions that have less. And this creates a structure of the universe that we have today, which is known as the cosmic web. So, um, yeah, the structure that it creates is basically a web-like structure, and this simulation, uh, this image shows you this, this very large structure. So this here on the bottom is 300 million light years across, and at the nodes of the cosmic web, this is where the galaxy clusters are. So at the densest points in the cosmic web, basically like spiders in a web, this is where galaxy clusters live. And they grow through mergers with other galaxy clusters. So, um, yeah, basically these, these cosmic spiders, they slowly start to attract nearby uh, smaller groups and larger clusters, and this is how, through mergers of clusters, these clusters grow. Um, so cluster mergers is actually what my PhD is focused on. So, what happens when we have the largest structures in the universe, these giant clusters of galaxies, and we actually take two of them and we smash them into each other. Now, here you see a, uh, an example of a, a cluster merger with regular eyes, so with uh, optical telescopes at optical wavelengths, and there's not really much to see here. If you would ask me, is this cluster, is this a single cluster, is this uh, two clusters merging, I, I wouldn't know anything. But if I turn on Francois's eyes, if I turn on an X-ray telescope, you can see, as Francois also mentioned in his talk, clusters are basically these huge balls of hot gas, and here there are two of them actually starting to collide into each other. And okay, I'll skip that one because this one is a nice illustration of what happens when you have two 
balls of gas that are really hot and that are millions of light years across and they are bumping into each other. Um, what happens is a, is a lot like a weather system actually, where you have, uh, when two clouds are hitting each other, there's a lot of turbulence being uh, generated in the inside the clouds and there's huge shock waves being uh, created that are propagating outward out of the clouds uh, because of because of the smashing together of these two clouds. And in this way, we can actually see galaxy clusters as gigantic particle accelerators. So when these two giant blobs of gas are smashed into each other, the uh, the clouds, the intercluster medium, is just shaken up completely. There are shocks moving through it. Uh, the gas is randomly being pushed around, and this causes also the, the, the particles, the, the charged particles in the medium, to gain a lot of energy from this huge collision. And so this is basically CERN on steroids. It's, it's really a particle accelerator at a million light years across with ridiculously amounts of energy. So clusters are really good laboratories to study particle acceleration. And so, small recap for, for the introduction. We started from the initial fluctuations in the universe, very, very tiny fluctuations, which eventually grow into the cosmic web structure that we know today. This cosmic web structure contains clusters in the very densest regions of this structure. And these clusters actually grow and are still growing today by mergers with other clusters. And in this process of merging, there's an enormous amount of particle acceleration happening. So these merging clusters are basically giant particle accelerators. And this is then what we can observe in the radio. So I know you've all been waiting for it because it's the title of the talk after all. So what do we now see when we observe the galaxy clusters with radio telescopes? So, here's a, a cluster that I'm actually working on, which is ABLE2256, and this is the optical image. And when I turn on the radio, you can see that much actually like the X-ray, the entire intercluster medium, the entire space between the, ra the galaxies is actually filled with radio emission. And this radio emission, it comes in all shapes and sizes. And for the second part of the talk, I'll try to explain to you a little bit what we are actually seeing here, so that at the end of the talk you know uh, and can ex maybe explain to a friend or colleague uh, what, what you can see with radio eyes. So one thing that we see, as you saw in the illustration, is that when these two giant blobs of gas bash into each other, shocks are created. And it is at these shocks that also the charged particles, the, the, the electrons and protons actually gain a lot of energy and they actually light up in the radio. So this is, I think, one of the prettiest examples that we have of such a shock that is lighting up and we can see with radio telescopes. It's called the sausage cluster. And you can actually see two shocks. So there's a, a, the prettiest one, that the, what's called the sausage, is up top. And there's a counter shock right here that we can see in the radio. At the, the white shows the x-ray, so there's not two clumps anymore, but it's just been destroyed along the, along the axis of the merger. And if I zoom in, just so you can get a little bit of an appreciation of the size of these shocks. Uh, so this is a million light years, and maybe if you're sitting at the front, you can see here, that's the Milky Way. So that's the galaxy that we are living in at the moment, and this shock is at least uh, easily a hundred times the size of our entire galaxy. So, ridiculously large shocks that are lighting up in the radio. What else can we see? Um, so these shocks we generally see at the outsides of the galaxy clusters because they are generally propagating outwards when these two clusters merge. Um, but at the center of the clusters we usually also see uh, gigantic, well, I'm going to say blobs again, because uh, that's what everything looks like in radio. Um, gigantic blobs of radio emission, uh, which we call a radio halo. So in the center of clusters, where the, the gas is really uh, concentrated, 
the turbulence actually causes particles to be accelerated and these particles, this process is a bit more random which is why it doesn't give this nice collimated shock shape but it just gives you this random halo basically of, of radio emission. So that's the two, two main things that we see when uh, huge clusters of galaxies are colliding. Um, but there's also other things you could probably notice in this image. Uh, you can see, as Francois pointed out, also in his talk, there's also jets of uh, radio emission coming from galaxies. Um, so you might wonder, what is the effect on the galaxies actually inside clusters when they are merging? And uh, what, does this, what does this look like? So, uh, yeah, I can go over this a little bit quicker, I guess, because, so, as Francois said, almost all galaxies actually have a central black hole in the center, so a supermassive black hole in the center, and if we are lucky, they also have enough gas and dust around them that they start to build this, this disk, this very hot disk around them, and then they produce two jets, and these jets we can actually observe in the radio, as you can see on this, this composite image on the right, you can see a single galaxy and the central black hole is spewing out these two fountains of uh, charged particles which emit radio emission. And actually in clusters, because the medium is so dense and the galaxies are moving quite fast through the uh, cloud of hot gas, it's basically like they are feeling a headwind. Like you're biking very quickly and your hair is just flowing backwards. And that's actually also what happens to radio galaxies. So this, this simulation here shows that this, these two jets, they initially just want to propagate outwards, but as the galaxy moves very quickly through the intercluster medium, the jets are actually bent. And depending on the exact conditions in the cluster, this can generate very different, beautiful images of radio galaxies. And sometimes when a shock passes over them or when uh, they get caught in a very turbulent region, these galaxies can actually grow to be much larger than we would actually expect or um, think would be possible from just calculations of how big these things can get. So, in summary, I hope you now know a little bit what this image is showing you. So. Uh, Able 2256 again, where you can see a giant radio halo, uh, a radio shock more near the edge of the cluster, which is a lot uh, messier than the, the pretty example of the shock that I showed you before. This is a really pretty long tailed radio galaxy, which is just bent so much that we can actually only see uh, a single stripe. So there's probably two jets coming out of the galaxy but it's just, it has so much pressure coming towards it that it's just bent all the way back. Um, and there's various other radio galaxies in this uh, cluster. So if you want to uh, remember one thing from this talk, if, if, I mean, this is a lot of information at the same time just that I've thrown at you, is that clusters, just remember that clusters are giant particle accelerators and that we can see that in the radio. Thank you very much. Each other, 
the medium in between the clusters is already stirred up enough that we can observe what we call a bridge of radio emission between the clusters. So even outside the clear cases of, of shocks, the medium here gets enough and can have enough energy that it sometimes emits radio emission. But our telescopes are just becoming sensitive enough that we can actually see stuff happening outside the cluster. So it's still a fairly big mystery what is happening also between clusters uh, in what we call the, the, the filaments, the cosmic filaments between the clusters. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay, so how often does this happen and uh, could this happen to the Milky Way? So, it, okay, so these, these processes, they take, a, they, they take a very long time, so for, uh, for a single cluster, it probably merges, it, like a very massive cluster has probably merged one or two times in the whole lifetime of the universe, because a single merger, it takes like two billion years. And for as to what it does to the galaxies, the galaxies are actually very, you can see them as very small points just scattered throughout the cluster. And the chances of, for example, a galaxy in one cluster colliding with another galaxy in another cluster are very, very small. Just like, for example, when our galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, would merge with Andromeda in, a, uh, in the future probably the solar system won't bash into any stars of Andromeda because space is just very empty between the galaxies uh, as it is for the stars, for example, in our, in our galaxy. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have two questions, actually. First of all, the shock wave that is produced, um, how quickly is it moving? And typically. And, um, Hypothetically, if the if the Milky Way were to be caught in a shock wave, what would that look like on our instruments? Like what what kind of energy would that show up in our telescopes, our radios, etc.? Yeah. Okay. So for the speed of the shock wave, I'm not actually entirely sure at what speeds this is moving. It's so I think the sausage. But okay, I'm, I'm afraid to give a number now, but. <laughs> It's at least more than a few thousand kilometers per hour. I, I would be certain to, to give that number. Um, and as for the effect on the galaxies, so actually a, a study a few years ago found that when such a shock wave passes through galaxies, it can actually reignite star formation. So it can actually cause uh, the gas in the galaxies to be, again, uh, clumped together and new star formation to start. So it would be, uh, yeah, that, that, would be, that would be nice. I mean, we could probably have more stars in our, in our galaxy, at least for a short while. Thank yeah, you. thanks. Any final questions? Okay. Yes, um, what, so you gave a presentation, what does your research itself focus on? Is it about mapping? Is it about distribution? Yeah, OK. Uh, very nice question. Yeah, so my research self is focused on basically the processes that generate these structures. So we know that particle acceleration is happening at these structures because we can see them. And um, so one thing I didn't mention was we don't only need charged particles, but we also need magnetic fields in clusters. So what one part that I'm trying to look at is what are the properties of these magnetic fields in clusters. So one big challenge in science, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I will solve this in my PhD, but is uh, how do magnetic fields evolve in clusters? Because we know there are magnetic fields, but we don't really know where they come from or how they really grow through, through, um, through time. And another part is basically what are the processes uh, in detail? Because, for example, we know that shocks can accelerate particles, but when you do the calculations, it's actually not efficient enough for the amount of light that we're seeing here. So uh, that's an interesting mystery. It might be solved by 
radio galaxies that are actually giving a population of sort of half halfly energized particles that can then be re-accelerated by a shock, which then needs a little bit less efficiency. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's what I'm focusing on. The, the details of this particle acceleration and the magnetic fields in clusters. All right, thank you so much. Let's give it up one more time. Maybe another applause. <laughs> I'm actually loving the, the real life applause again. <laughs> so much better than the Zoom one. So we'll take it, we'll take it. And then uh, finally, just a big thank you to everyone else on our team. And most of us are here today, but definitely not all of us. And this also couldn't have been possible without the support from the Lion's Tablet office. So. Thank you and thank you all for coming and I hope to see you next time.